lost without hope with no place to be again. You will love me away to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my high life began. Ash was redeemed. introduce our two speakers for this morning. Troy, you probably know. Troy is our lead pastor here at Avon. Well, and Clayton Kipfer, you probably know as well. Clayton and Amy have been longtime members and leaders in our congregation, and I think we're going to hear from Troy and Clayton this morning in a bit of an interview or back and forth form, which is going to be awesome. So come on up, guys. I gave Clayton the higher stool because I look up to you, brother. <laughs> Well, David Letterman, some of you will know who that is, has a recent, it's a recently new show called uh, My Next Guest Needs No Introduction. That's kind of how I feel about the man sitting next to me. Uh, for those of you who have not had the privilege of getting to know Clayton, I would say this, Clayton, you are 
one of the most spiritually mature people I know. And I've often told my family that I hope I turn out like Clayton when I grow up. <laughs> if that ever happens. But, well, I've asked Clayton to share a bit of his life story and faith journey with us this morning, and he has graciously agreed to do that. So without further ado, let's dive in. Clayton and I have often heard that the best place to begin is the beginning. So why don't we go back to your origins, and I'm wondering if you could share some pivotal moments in your early life that shaped you, your life, and your faith in God. My parents left the Amish church when I was 10 years of age, and going to Sunday school for the first time and hearing the stories of Jesus was a very pivotal time in my life. Our services were in German in the Amish church. So now I was understanding the stories. And those stories really impacted me because At a young age, I felt a sense of being God, God calling me. And I observed my dad some at that point. He was having trouble with the, the Amish way of believing because during his time of illness, he had gone to a thrift store and found a Bible, an English Bible. All he had up to this point was a German Bible. And so at age 10, I remember him reading from the Bible. And he would tell the ministers that he can't. The life of Jesus for him is, and the call of Jesus is the way. And he didn't hear that as he thought it should be taught in the church. So that was a, an important part of my life, that Dad made that decision. And we went to Riverdale Mennonite Church. John 3.16 was my first verse. And I felt that it was part of the story when I heard Jesus' words. I remember it, that was age 10, it, by age 12, under the direction of a Sunday school teacher, and I still remember, remember the place in that old church it's been run by Troy, and maybe it's gone. But the staircase that led from the basement upstairs, underneath that staircase, we had a small Sunday school class, about six of us boys, and the teacher was teaching from the scripture, and John chapter, 10 verse 16 was part of the lesson. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. That was my call to ministry. And that verse never, ever left me at age 12. The songs, the music, music has been a central part of my life. The songs we sang in Sunday school, the old church and Sunday school hymnal, which I still have a copy of and go back to once in a while. You know, when you do get older, the things that have been filed in your memory come back. 
And so I'm grateful for the heritage I have. Those things that were taught, and those things we did together, we, we sang together, and the centrality of Jesus and all that has been my foundation. And in my aging times, when I'm challenged with physical challenges like I'm at the moment, it's a rock in a place of joy and groundedness. So we're, we got to move here, Troy. We'll be <laughs> anyway, I, that was age 12 when the scriptures got to mean a lot to me. Age 16, I experienced the sadness and confusion when my favorite pastor, we had two pastors at Riverdale at that time. Uh, my favorite pastor who paid attention to my family and me started the conservative movement and started another church on the opposite side of Millbank and uh, divided some families, my cousins, not only divided the church, but divided families. And that was for me a very painful time. And uh, yeah, I learned later how deeply it hurt me. Age 18, I still felt the call to ministry and with the encouragement of my pastor and father, I went to Bible training at First Mennonite Church in Kitchener and I graduated in 1961. I have a story from that time. We were a large family and very poor. And of course it costs money to go to school. And after one and a half years in school, I decided I was going to quit. This is too hard. I couldn't get the funds to pay the bills. And I'll always remember one morning on the way to school, the guy I was riding with said, we're going to stop at my dad's place. I've got to go in and talk to him a bit. And he came out and handed me a hundred dollar bill. And from that moment on, I was convinced that God would provide the funds that were needed for my education. Thanks for sharing. The next stage of your life involved you meeting someone. Uh, most of us know this person as Amy, Pastor Amy, uh, recently retired pastor of congregational care here at Avon. So I'm wondering, how did you meet Amy? And I'm wondering if you can share some of the, uh, the blessings and the challenges of life as a husband and father and a young pastor. Amy had a lot of relatives in our area. In our, <clears throat> in our church as well. So of course they came from Michigan to visit these relatives. And when I saw her, I knew I would pursue that possibility. <laughs> Four years later, we got married in Michigan in her home church. And we lived in the US for about six years and moved back to Ontario in 1968 to go to Emmanuel Bible College and there we, I found that balancing our family life with three young children and Amy working part-time as a nurse, I went to school and proved my going to school and God's provision of providing and guiding us was so real to me. Uh, 
At the time, I had some wonderings uh, about the decision because it included learning Greek. And um, I never found school easy. I had to work very hard at school all, all my life. I was jealous of the, some people who just seemed to get it without even trying. And I spent a lot of time trying to memorize Greek while I was doing the chores in the barn on the farm where we lived during this time. And you know, it worked well. It seems the cattle cooperated. They listened, they listened to my Greek and all was well. Anthropos, that's about the only Greek word I really remember. I didn't, I didn't enjoy the Greek either. But I'm hearing a, a, a thread, a theme here of God's provision that just became more and more real to you. Mm -hmm. The next phase of your life, you, 19 years, you were at Zurich? Yes. In the I'm, I'm wondering if you can share with us some of the things that you learned about church, about yourself, about ministry during that first pastor. Okay, I will say that I was strongly supported by Mennonite Conference of Eastern Canada, financially and otherwise. And when they asked me to serve as pastor at Zurich Mennonite, there was also the Blake Mennonite Church in the country. So they asked me to serve two churches who were planning to build a new building and come together. When they told me that, I said, that's not for a new pastor just starting out. I can't do that. So I declined the invitation to do that. And you know, God's timing is impeccable. We had an evangelist uh, from New York City named John Smucker, a uh, Mennonite pastor who had experienced a renewal of the Holy Spirit in his life. And he was going around to churches giving testimony to what he saw happening, not only in his life and in the churches. And he said, the most disappointing part for him at his point of life, which was kind of midlife, is to see the potential of all the young people in churches and the lack of courage they have to go into ministry and, and follow God's calling in their life. Because it is a daunting call. I want to recognize that every person here this morning has probably sensed a call in your life and you know how scary it can be because you need to get education in the field and you need to develop some expertise and how you feel about yourself, what you've had happen to you in the past, all impacts that moment. So I want to recognize the calling of everybody here this morning. I, I, I got a book given to me recently that said, Jesus is calling. <laughs> and that kind of struck me. I think he's calling all of us to something. And, and one role is not more important than the other because the church is designed with all the gifts so that it can be perfected. And so I want to honor every person here this morning as having been called. But anyway, I, one reason I said no to that call to, to serve the church was I was deeply hurt by the split in our church and my favorite pastor going across town and starting another one. 
And I concluded that probably pastoral work is not for me because I'm afraid. And when I graduated from Bible College, that's a space I was in. I was afraid to serve. So John Smucker, that story again, gave an invitation to come forward to prayer for all those who felt God calling. And I went forward for prayer and I thought, that'll be great to have John pray for me. Guess what happened? To uh, one of my Sunday school teachers and another pastor from a, a neighboring church and I forget who the third person was they prayed with me. Well, first of all, I told them my fear about pastoral leadership and having to lead a congregation that might have some fights. And you know, that's very real in the church. We have disagreements and that's, that's okay. That's important. We all felt like it would be pretty boring. <laughs> Plus, I, I think we would be misdirected. I think we need all the voices. So anyway, I was afraid that I would be caught in conflict and conflict had deeply hurt me and I would not be able to do it. So the, after those three guys prayed for me, it wasn't the evangelist. Those three guys I knew prayed for me after I told them my story of hurt. I, I left that evening. I've never had such a, I called it the baptism of the spirit. I was just overwhelmed with joy and new freedom. And so I had the courage to move forward and say yes to the Zurich and Blake churches their call for me to lead them in pastoral ministry. I have more stories I want to ask you about that, but we, I guess we should keep moving on. We'll, we'll do another interview with follow-up questions in a couple months, please. Um, but moving on, you, you went to seminary after 19 years of pastoring at Zurich. And this was from what you've shared with me in previous conversations, this was a profound stage of life for you. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the season of healing and growth and what were some of the big shifts that occurred within you in your life? Well, I discovered at age 52 is when I went to seminary, Amy and I both went <clears throat> and I realized that I was facing my midlife crisis. <laughs> I moved away from the church family and my family of origin. And we were in Virginia with Mostly people we didn't know. There were a few people we had known, but the loneliness of that time in my life, the isolation, I should probably make one step back into the Zurich experience in relation to this loneliness and isolation. And I'm sorry, I, I lost my original notes, but I have two books with me about the two stages of life. And uh, if you want to ask questions about them afterwards, I would highly recommend, recommend them. The one is by Richard Rohr, and the other one is Basil Pennington. So I have those books with me that talk about these stages. The first part of the stages, which I had marked in my other notes, I don't know if I can find them here, but have to do with what Pennington, 
the first stage of life has to do with what I have, what I do, and what others think of me. That's the first half of life. The second half of life, we, we begin to understand that what I have, what I do, and what, I, what others think of me does not matter so much. But become aware that what really matters is an increasing awareness of God's presence integrating with my inner journey and Christ within a discovery of the true self. This work happened with the guidance of professors and counseling and small group work while I was in seminary. Another point of healing for me was, as well as seminary, based on in seminary, we were encouraged to put ourselves, place ourselves in scripture stories to find who we are and where we're going. So in my journaling on the hill, looking at the mountains one day, I, I was reminded of the story of Jesus. I was feeling loneliness, and I was, yeah, midlife crisis is no fun. <laughs> it, like, where, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? What I had planned wasn't working. Our plans for Amy and I were to be at seminary for two years or so, get the training, go on to a church planting assignment. That's what we felt called to. Seven years later, we still weren't going anywhere. So back to the story of the leper. This is one reason I wasn't going anywhere, because I was not prepared for it. And our next call was Toronto for 12 years. Uh, in the city, uh, North Toronto, uh, we would have never survived. I would have never survived without this experience on the, with Jesus, putting myself in the story, Jesus coming down from the mountain. I could see them, those beautiful mountains in Virginia, the, in the Shenandoah Valley is where we went to school. And as I journaled and taught and prayed, I don't remember whether it was visual, it was partly visual, but it very much impacted me that Jesus was in the mountain and then he came down from the mountain and the crowds surrounded him as they usually did, but he kept walking and he came right to me and he touched me. My loneliness receded and I realized that now I knew what I needed to know and that is that God loves me and has a purpose for me for the second half of my life. And I had, again, the confidence to move forward. So back to the question you asked me, Troy, I'm sorry for digressing, but I felt that was, that was probably the most freeing experience I had in seminary and the preparation that I needed to move on to the next assignment. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. That's, uh, yeah, powerful. Life-changing moment. Mm -hmm. So after seminary, you went to minister in North Toronto with Amy. 
wondering if you can talk a, a bit about that. That was a fairly unfamiliar setting, to say the least. Can you share a few of the highlights? What stood out? I'll read some of this because the words I thought are, are kind of important. Adapting to a multi-ethnic, multi-faith community was intense and exciting. Can you remember? I grew up in Millbank, served at Zurich, which is even more remote in the sense. So my experiences, and in Virginia as well, were mostly rural experiences. So this was brand new. Exciting? It was exciting. Filled with many surprises and also some pain. The learning curve on all levels was intense. So I have two stories to tell you what that was like. The first one is I was into music ever since Sunday school. And by the time I was about 14 or so, I was leading congregational singing in our church with a pitch pipe. We didn't have all this, this uh, what would you say, accompaniment. It was a cappella. Yeah. And uh, that was at age 14. So music, for me, has become Well, I guess the scripture talked a lot about it. God gives us a song. Music comes from the heart, from within. The, the authors or writers have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to put it down in words. And I'll tell you some of the songs uh, of, in the old hymn books come back to me word for word and I've forgotten them at a time when I needed. So mu music has been very nourishing for me. So we get in this multi-ethnic, multicultural setting, mostly Jamaican. And my music didn't jive with their kind of music. <laughs> Something was wrong. I was trying, I was confident I could lead. Amy was on the guitar. And I knew a, a large range of songs, like the good old songs, the hymns that everybody knows, and also a lot of new songs. And one Sunday morning, they actually started laughing at me, trying to, to lead music. Well, the Lord gave me grace to laugh with them. Right up. Beautiful. <laughs> So, at that point, Amy and I had a, a serious meeting with each other <laughs> and decided we got to expand the, the, the group. So, uh, we had a fella that was a school teacher, played the steel drums. So, we said, you need to bring those into church. We didn't know how we'd, you know, accommodate this. And then we went and bought a brand new drum set. And we, got, we knew the young guys had rhythm. And so uh, we set up this drum set. And we didn't have to beg anybody to play the drums. <laughs> uh, those young kids were amazing on the drums. A little noisy. But... Uh, we did worship, seriously. We did worship. And Amy got a, a young girl playing the keyboard. So we had three instruments and lots of exuberant voices. We were probably around, you know, it would be as low as 15 and then could go up as high as 35 on a Sunday morning in a high rise apartment building. And I'm sure some people were wishing we would be quieter on a Sunday morning, but yeah, we had some great times. One of our highlights was Hidden Acres Camp. A lot of you know 
How many know about Hidden Acres Camp or have been there? About half of you or more? Well, we have <laughs> we have Mary Ann and Brent and family. They live there and work there. And uh, Hidden Acres Camp has had a, a single mom's camp for how many years, Mary Ann? Over 30 years. When we went to Toronto, the people were talking about single mom's camp, and we didn't know about the connection with Hidden Acres at that point. So we said, well, what can we do to help, you know, to help this happen in, in our church? And so we soon found out there were a number of moms and kids wanted to go to camp. And the ones involved in our church had been to camp, so that was really their spiritual journey. And I'm big into camping in that sense, that kids get out in the environment of God's beautiful creation. And again, they get teaching of scripture and songs, and, and the big thing is building relationships with each other. And I think camping is almost a must for kids these days to get them away. I don't think they allow the devices there. I'm not sure. Uh, so there's a ban on devices, but you are welcome. And I hope that all our kids have that experience. Um, so we, we came to Hidden Acres on a retreat once a year. Brought the single moms in the summertime. We provided transportation. Hidden Acres provided funding to help us do this. And then we would come to a retreat once a year, and I'll just say one thing that happened at a retreat. It was uh, celebrating Easter, Palm Sunday. And uh, I suppose there were about 25 of us or 30 with kids, maybe more. And uh, we had palm branches, music, and we were marching around that place uh, and, and dancing and singing, marching in the light of God. And that was a highlight that I'll never forget. And afterwards, one of the girls, ladies from our church, had planned a, a balloon release we went out, we each had a balloon, and we went outside and had a bit of a ceremony around letting go of the stuff that we shouldn't be hanging on to and moving on in our faith journey. And we let these balloons, we released the balloons, and I can still see them floating away. Transformation happens in moments that are most unexpected sometimes when we worship together. And I just value the faith community at this point more than ever before. Well, this brings us to your retirement stage. And you had retirement plans, Clayton, that didn't exactly unfold the way you had hoped. Yeah, we won't spend much time on that one, but when I retired in 2010, and Amy and I, I was quite involved with Mennonite Disaster Service. We would take people from Jane and Finch and Stouffville. There was a guy in Stouffville, Markham. We'd team up together and go down to Southern states usually, I think we did it for five years. And uh, those were, I felt very important for our church, for people to get out outside of their setting and serve somewhere else. 
So we had an interesting range of age from teenagers to people that are probably older than me joined those uh, one week events with Mennonite Disaster Service in the South. So Amy, I felt I was committed to continuing as a director of uh, the different units in different locations. So Amy and I went to Louisiana, uh, to New Iberia, Louisiana, for three months in 2010. I think I got the, doesn't matter the date, it's in there somewhere. And it was a good experience, but we come home and I then ended up with bypass surgery, prostate surgery, and long, slow recovery. And we had a number of deaths in, in Amy's family at the time, her mom and, yeah, I forget the details. But anyway, I was at home all that time and she went alone to, to Michigan. We moved to Stratford in 2011, spring of 2011, to be close to family. And uh, yeah, so I, I realized that continuing with MDS would not be an option, a wise option. So we transitioned to finding a new way to serve. And uh, you asked me, Troy, if I would give leadership to the social justice issues of the day. And the one that was up at that moment to deal with was the indigenous issues that we're all well informed about. So Dave and Margie Fulton were the, became the leaders of that group. They moved here from the north. And we have Linda, we have a few other people here this morning who served with me on that, in that group. And I found that very fulfilling, Troy, and, and very educational for myself. And I feel good about, yeah, good is not the, the best word. I feel grateful that we came here to Avon because we've experienced a lot of support and an outlet for the gifts that we have uh, developed over the years in, in leadership. And we just thank God for this opportunity. Well, we're certainly glad you came to Stratford and Avon as well, brother. Life has thrown you a few curveballs, Clayton, and recently life has thrown you another curveball. I'm wondering if you can share what's, what that has been like for you and what has prepared you for this latest challenge, what is sustaining you, and, and what you need most from us, your church family. I've written this out, the latest curveball and I put it in story form. I got a piece of that curveball and drove it to left field <laughs> and made it to first base. <laughs> now I am dependent on good coaching and good batters to make it home safely. My team at University Hospital has been most reassuring. From Dr. Sue Smith, a young female neuromuscular specialist, to a speech therapist, social worker, dietitian, physiotherapist, and oh, there's one more that helps you with your activity, occupational therapist, that was it. <clears throat> 
and also uh, home care connections. I felt great compassion, understanding, and continued to get follow-up calls and will return to University Hospital for team assessment every three months. Another part of the team is my family, all the way from Virginia to Stratford and Wilmot Center. We have all been together in the past month. Amy is my incredible, incredible team leader. Now, instead of hours for visits with our church family as pastor of congregational care, I get all that attention and more. <laughs> Please remember to tell her you are a fan. We need to be cheered on, especially in the quiet, uncertain times. This is life as it unfolds in God's timing. And God has provided us with an incredible support base here at Avon. Last week, my brother-in-law commented to me, I experience you as being in a place of peace and surrender. That felt good and right. I attribute this place of surrender to the nurture I have experienced at Avon in our focus on the presence, the presence of, of God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit. Troy's sermons have inspired me. God has placed readings in my life, books and articles that reinforce that God is present at all times. The Holy Spirit, the great coach, keeps whispering to me and directing me. I know if I had the stamina to steal, no, I don't know if I have the stamina to steal second or third base, but I am confident in God's provision to bring me safely home. Amen. Clayton, thanks so much for sharing so openly, humbly, honestly. I love your presence. I am a fan. Both you and Amy and I will continue to cheer you on. You're my brother, you're a mentor, you're a model to me, and uh, I'm just grateful that we, we all had this opportunity to hear from you. Can I close with a prayer? Yeah. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, thank you for our brother Clayton. What a blessing this man has been to me personally, to my family, to our church family, and to so many others. I pray that Clayton feels our love, our gratitude, and our support. I pray that Clayton feels your love and your support and feels your presence with him every step of the way from first base all the way home. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen.